Let's turn in our Bibles to James chapter 3. A little uh, detour from our normal Sunday, uh, Sunday messages going through Psalms. We're going to look at James at chapter 3. Now this is a lesson that uh, we taught on Wednesday in our, in our Bible study. And it's a lesson that I think is very, very important for us to learn uh, as Christians and as, as human beings. And it's a lesson about something that we all slip up on. Something that causes so much trouble, not just within our church, not just within our families, but within ourselves as well. And I just want you to see who this message is to. He says there in James chapter 3, he says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man and no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and cursings. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Here James does not hold any punches. He says, he says it as it is. He doesn't try to beat around the bush. So some of these things he's saying seem, re seem really strong and offensive. But when we look at it, we realize that he's, he's telling us the truth. You know, he's telling us exactly what we need to know to understand uh, how uh, destru dest destructive uh, the tongue can be if it's used in the wrong way. This verse, this, uh, these verses uh, hearken us back to James chapter 1 uh, and verse 19 where James is teaching about the testing of your faith and hearing and doing the word. Be a hearer of the word, uh, sorry, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. But in verse 19 he says, Know this, my beloved br brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. So you see those first two, they're quick to hear, but slow to speak, taking care of what our tongues say and how we use them. It also reflects verse 26 of that same chapter, where it says, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is, what does that say, worthless. And then we know how the misuse of our tongues can destroy our testimony, can shut the doors on our witness, so that others cannot see the Lord Jesus Christ through us. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. So the first group of people that James is addressing here are the teachers, the leaders, the pastors, Sunday school teachers, but also those of us who have that responsibility of discipling somebody or leading somebody in the way they should go. He's, that's the first group of people that James is talking about because we have that greater power. How many of us have been told something by our pastor, for instance, myself, and you're just taking it for granted? Yet it could be totally wrong. That's why, like Bereans, we bring our Bibles to church, so you can check what is being said. How often do we hear things 
and just take them for granted, not realizing that actually it's being used to control us, to drag us away from the, way, from the path of righteousness. Blessed is the man who, who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners. Because all of that, listening to the tongue, will lead us to standing, uh, sitting in the seat of the scornful. Not many of you might, uh, should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will ju be judged with greater strictness. And now this puts the onus on those of us who teach and lead, whether it's up here, whether it's in the Sunday school, whether it's somebody that you're ministering to, to realize that at that, that time and what you are saying to that person, for that you will be judged more strictly because of the power that you have. It says, that, it says there in verse 2, For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. And we all know that we stumble. I'm sure we can recount many, many occasions this week, or even today, that we have stumbled along that path of righteousness. We've tripped up over something that has happened to us or something that we've heard or even just something because our hearts are wicked. Just something that our hearts have put before us. Some sin that has reared its ugly head in our lives. And we've stumbled. But notice the word that he uses there, that word stumble. Because it's slightly different from fall. Because when you fall it has the idea that you don't get up again. You can't get up. But stumbling is almost as if you haven't fallen, you, you've stumbled forward and you, you've caught yourself in time, which is a blessing for us to realize that when we stumble, we can do that. We can get back up on that path of righteousness because that's where Christ leads us. So it says we all stumble and we all stumble in many ways. Some pe somebody will stumble one way and somebody will stumble another. And then you'll wonder, how can you stumble like that? That's not even a, a, a problem, but it is to them. It is to them. That's when we come up and help them. We come alongside them. We lift them up. For we all stumble in many ways. But look what he says then. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. Now, can, you, can anybody say that I do not stumble in what I say? Every word that comes out of my mouth is righteous, is true. I never lie. I never gossip. I never swear. Can anybody say that? No. So, look, so uh, James is kind of t uh, speaking tongue in cheek. That's, that's apt. He's, he's, he's talking in tongue in cheek here. He's saying, if, any man, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, not even what he does, just what he says, he says he is a perfect man. So the idea here is that if you can control your tongue all the time, you will be perfect. And yet we know that only one was perfect, and that was Jesus Christ. So therefore we know that none of us are perfect, and none of us can control our tongue. It seems to, this seems to be a hard, a hard thing to do here, what he's expecting from us. But then if we... If we don't stumble in what we say, which makes us perfect, look what he says there, able also to bridle his whole body. So if you can control that small thing that is in your mouth, your tongue, and what you say by it, then you should be able to control your whole body and never sin. Can anybody do that? No, of course not. Only Christ could do that. He lived without sin. Everything that he says was true and righteous. Everything that he, that he did glorified God. Verse 3 says, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Now, James is starting to give us some illustrations here, and he gives us a number of illustrations, and we'll address them as we go through. The first one, he compares us to horses, uh, to large ships, uh, to a forest fire, going all the way down to animals that can or cannot be tamed. And finally, as a spring of water. This is what he's comparing the tongue to. He says there in verse, uh, in verse 3, if we put bits in the mouths of horses, large horses, imagine a shire horse, 
is controlled by a small piece of metal that goes in its mouth, that holds its tongue down. And sometimes we know people who should have that bit in their mouths. And sometimes we need to realise perhaps we should have that bit in our mouths. So that God can control what we say and what we do. And he can guide our whole bodies. We have his word here that tells us what we should do and what we should say. And yet how often do we veer away from that? But if we put bits in those mouths of horses so that they obey us, holding that tongue. You've heard that phrase when we said to people, hold your tongue. So stop talking, stop saying what you're saying because it's wrong. If we can hold our tongue when we're not supposed to, sorry, when we don't want to, then we can control the body and stop ourselves from doing something that we will be sorry about or something that will embarrass the Lord. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Your tongue and the way you use it will steer your body through the course of this world, either down a path of righteousness or down a path of sinfulness. That's how strong, that's how much power this small member of your body has upon you. It guides your life and the life of others. How many, how many, uh, how many people in history do, do we know? How many nations, how many countries where wars have started? People have been uh, murdered and executed. Uh, 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 genocide has happened because of someone's misuse of their tongue. Someone's lie, someone's, someone's mistruths. It says there in verse 4, look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. Now James takes that illustration a little step forward here. We have almost the same illustration as the last verse about the horse. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large, uh, ships today are much bigger than they were in those days. Just imagine those super tankers. And they are all steered by a very small rudder at the back. And that guides the whole ship. Guides it through the seas. But look out what else he says. They are so large and driven by strong winds. When we walk through life, we face these strong winds. We face these waves. When hardship and trials and temptations come upon us, when life just seems too much to bear, we have to realise that our tongue guides us through that. If we say the wrong thing, it can get much worse. If we say the right things, it could probably get better. One of the best uses for the tongue when we're going through the winds and the waves of life is to pray, is to utter the name of the Lord, to cry to Him, to wail to Him, to ask for His forgiveness, to beg His protection, His guidance. That's the best use of the tongue. If you confess the Lord with your tongue, that's what he says. They are driven by strong winds and they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. You control your tongue. Some people will say something sometimes and they'll say, oh, I never meant to say that. Well, yes, you did because you said it. Because you control your tongue. If you don't control your tongue, then you're a double-minded person. You're weak, and the winds will blow you around. So we control our tongues. And we direct our bodies with them, wherever the will, whether, where, where, wherever we will. So often in life, people's relationships, friendships, fellowships are ruined, destroyed, by something that somebody has said. So you're not only controlling your own life, you're also controlling the lives of others with what you say. So it's very important to guide that tongue in the right direction. He says in verse 5, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. It boasts of great things. Not only does... Do we tell people how wonderful we are, how great we are, or boasting about things, not just ourselves, perhaps our organisation, our country, our church, our people, whatever it is. 
but it boasts in the way it controls us and controls others. We need to be aware of that to control our tongues. Excuse me. Verse 3, sorry, verse, carry on in verse 5. So that also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. We all know about forest fires, we've seen them on the news, and we even know about them from just around here up in the moors. When the smallest spark, cigarette butts, a match, whatever it is, can set acres, square miles uh, on fire. And if anybody's seen a forest fire on the news or, or been near a, a large conf conflagration, that's a big word, uh, you'll understand how ferocious that is. I've seen it on the news when people are trying to flee from a forest fire and uh, they're in cars and it's catching up with them. All of that from a small spark. Now imagine what your tongue can do in that respect. One tiny little lie that you don't even... Th a, white, a white lie. No, that's not so bad, is it? Lying is a lie. You know, lying is sin. And we all do it. But imagine what that small lie can do. How it can set a forest of, on fire. And how it can set a people on fire. And cause so much trouble and destruction. Smoke. Blackness. Sin. Just from that small spark. See, Luke, it's not Luke, James is not sparing any illustrations here. He's not softening the blow because he wants you to really understand the whole import of this. He says in verse 6, he carries on, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. Now he starts really to tell us how bad the tongue actually is. And until we see this list, we think, yeah, well, we know the tongue is bad when we lie, when we, when, when, when we swear, when, when we gossip, and all of that. We, we understand that. But look what James says about the tongue. Some of these are, are really, really frightening. He says the tongue is a fire. Anybody put their hand in a fire? Fire spreads, destroys. He says there, it's a world of unrighteousness. Not just that it's unrighteous, but it's a world of unrighteousness. Meaning everything he says and does is unrighteous. He says it's a stain upon our whole body. Can you imagine that? A stain. The tongue is a stain on our whole body. He also says it's a fire from hell. Set on fire by hell. Because the only thing it does is wickedness. And that wickedness comes from somewhere we'll see. He says no one can tame the tongue. I know we've tried. You know, we bite our tongue, we hold our tongue. We try to tame it, but we cannot even tame our own tongue. He says it is a restless evil. Evil that is restless. Swift to shed blood. He describes it as a deadly poison that kills the body, whatever it touches. He says it curses people. It says cursing. It's salt water. It's a filthy salt pond. Look at these descriptions he gives us of what the tongue is like when it's doing its worst, when it's being really evil. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, he says. It is a fire that destroys. Because it's a world of unrighteousness. Everything we say by our tongue, when we're not in control of it, when we're not using that horse's bit, when we're not using that rudder, when we're not guiding our tongue, is a world of unrighteousness. It's so easy to tell a lie. It's so easy to use foul language. Even laughing at a, at a dirty joke or a, or a joke that is really you shouldn't be laughing at, we all do it. It sets our tongue. It, it, it's doing that. It's leading us into sin and unrighteousness. And it is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. 
He carries on. He says, the tongue is set among our members. It's set. We cannot move it. We cannot r remove it because it's there. It's going, to, it's going to do whatever it has to do. And if we're not guiding it, it's going to do evil things. Who is, who is the father of lies? Satan is the father of lies. And where do lies come from? They only come from one place. They come from your tongue. So when you're telling a lie, or using your tongue for wickedness, who are you serving? Are you serving God? Or are you serving the devil? James explains that to us towards the end, and we'll see. It's a set among our bodies, staining the whole body. A stain upon us. A stain that cannot be removed. It was very, very hard to remove. When we say something that hurts people, that destroys people, that causes churches to split, divides families, harms whole nations, puts people's lives at risk, that stain is so hard to remove. It will probably always be there. Look at the lies, for instance, that Hitler told about the Jewish people. We know there were lies. But look what happened from the lies of one man. Set a nation upon fire. Destroyed a, almost destroyed a whole nation. Even today, that's in our culture. That's in our stories, our movies. We have that now set in our minds. Stained. N never to be forgotten. There's countless times through history that has happened. There's probably countless times in your lives when you have, you've experienced that in one respect or another. That's not serving God. That's serving the devil. And he's there, he's laughing because he's got you to do something you shouldn't be doing. He stains the whole body. Setting on fire the entire course of life. Your life, your whole life can be changed by what you say. If you say wicked things, your life will be changed. You'll be off that path of righteousness. You'll be walking down another path. Path of wickedness, just because of what you've said. Or somebody else's life. You imagine a new Christian comes along, wants to get saved, and you say, well, I'm sorry, you can't come in here and get saved, uh, Mrs. Jones, because you've got trousers on. And women cannot wear trousers. Can, you hear what I'm saying here? We can almost, and a lot of Christians will accept what I've just said. But what was the problem? What have I just done? With my mouth I have stopped somebody from approaching the Lord. From getting saved. And that's just an example. Don't, that's just an example. I'll probably get in trouble with this people on the video. But that's just an example of there's many times that we can do that with what we say. And the devil laughs, because that's what he wants. Setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. That's where that fire comes from, that the tongue causes. And it comes from hell itself, from the devil. Eve in the garden, in the garden of Eden, she never lied. She never lied in her whole life, up to that point. They were perfect, they couldn't lie. Yet the devil could. And the devil spoke, used his tongue, deceived Eve. And what happened at the end of all of that? Adam fell from grace. Sin entered the world. One of the greatest lies ever told. Destroyed the whole course of life. Set on fire by hell. Death and sin entered the world. By one lie. This is how powerful that tongue is. It's frightening, really, when we think about it. Almost to the point where we think James is actually holding back here. You know? How frightening it can be. He says there in verse 7, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. And again, James is almost talk, uh, speaking tongue-in-cheek here. For every kind of beast, 
when you read beast in, the, in, in Scripture, it, it doesn't mean just any beast. It means a specific sort of beast. It means wild beasts. Lions, tigers, frightening things like that. Can you, can you tame a lion? Can you tame a leopard? Well, you can't even tame a house cat. Because they're wild. They always will be wild. So James is saying, they can be tamed. Can they be tamed? You know, he's almost being tongue-in-cheek here. For every kind of beast and bird. You know, I want you to go and tame the, the seagull that steals your chips at the seaside. You can't tame these creatures. But you have more chance of taming these than you have of the tongue. Reptiles. Sea creatures. Do you notice these animals here? He's not saying cattle. He's not saying domestic animals that we know can be tamed. These are all creatures that we, you know, can they be tamed? And he's saying they can be and, they, uh, 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 and, can, and, ha, and have been tamed by man. But this is in reflection to verse 8. But no human being can can tame the tongue. The tongue is much more dangerous than these beasts. Much more dangerous than a lion or a tiger. Much more heartless than a reptile. Much wilder than the birds. and More raucous. No human being can tame the tongue. So next time you're thinking, you know, you're... you're uh, you're lying, you're gossiping, or something slips out. You, you cannot tame that. It's going to happen. No man is perfect. If you could control the tongue, you could control your whole body. He carries on there in verse 8. It is a restless evil. Your tongue is a restless evil you need to control. Because that, it's not just evil. It means it's restless. It so desires to cause harm and death damage that at any moment he will get up and do something if you're, if you're sat at home and you're restless, you can't relax you can't just sit there, you've got to get up and do something you're pottering around you, 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 you're going out, you're just doing things constantly, this is the restlessness of that evil tongue and the one thing it wants to do is to do evil because it's set on fire by hell, it's guided by the devil again, very strong words from, from James it is a restless evil. Look what he says then. Full of deadly poison. Not just poison. Deadly poison. You know there are poisons out there that can take d days to harm or kill somebody. There are poisons out there that just a few micrograms of it. Micrograms, is that right? Micrograms touching the skin can kill. This is what he's talking about. You can destroy someone's entire life with just a few words. I, I would rather get a beating off my mother when I, when I was naughty. I would rather, and she used a six foot cane, I would rather get the cane off my mother than hear her, some of the things that she would say to me that would destroy me. Dest actually destroy me. Because that's how dangerous the tongue is. We have another saying, a good tongue lashing. You know, we would, I would rather get the cane than have a tongue lashing. That's how powerful and damaging the tongue is. Just like a deadly poison. Well, look what he says in verse 9. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people. We bless our Lord and Father. We pray mightily in church. We sing wonderful hymns. We read the scripture. We pray to God every day. We preach the gospel message. You do these wonderful things with our tongues. Praising and worshipping God. And then we curse somebody. And I can guarantee you, you'll get back in your car, you'll drive down the road, somebody will cut you up. And what do you instantly want to do? You want to curse them. But what he says about that. And with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Everybody is made in the likeness of God. We will praise God at one moment and then we'll curse people. So what's the point of praising God if we're cursing those who are made in His image? Because we're cursing His image. 
We might as well curse God and not bless him. Which should we do? Should we curse God as we curse people or should we bless people as we bless God? You see the use of the tongue and what it should be doing. With it we bless our Lord and Father and with it we curse people. Look at Matthew chapter 22. We'll see an important teaching here. When somebody asked Jesus an important question, which is the greatest of the commandments? Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. We bless the Lord with our tongue. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. How can we bless God and curse man? Because we're disobeying his commandments right there. And he says all of these, the, these two commandments compass the whole of the law and the prophets. So if you're going to do anything wrong against the law or against God or against the, what are the prophets have said or the gospel message, cursing your neighbor covers an awful lot of that. So that is something we definitely should not be doing. With it we bless our Lord and Father and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. In verse 10 he carries on, from the same mouth come blessings and cursings. You bless people and you curse people all at the same time. He says, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. They sh sh this shouldn't be happening. When you catch yourself about to curse somebody, just realize that that person, though they've done a heinous crime against you, is made in the image of God. And instead of cursing them, you should be preaching to them. Instead of swearing at them, you should be telling them the gospel message. Even though they may have done something against you. Where am I? From the same mouth come blessings and cursings. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. He's really imploring people. Stop it. Don't do this. Verse 11. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? If you turn your cold tap on at home, what comes out of it? What are you expecting to come out of it? Clean water or salty water? You're expecting clean water to come out of it. When God turns our mouth on, what is he expecting to come out of it? Clean water. And wherever you see the reference to clean or fresh water in the scripture, this is a picture that references it all but the way back to the Garden of Eden and the two rivers that flow out of it. And the side of Jesus Christ that was pierced and the water of life came out. The river of eternal life that flows from God's throne through, through heaven. Fresh water has life giving potential in it. When you speak the truth, when you use your mouth to glorify God, that's the water of life that is coming out. When you don't, it's just dirty, salty water. Can you drink salty water? No, it'll drive you mad. It'll damage you horrendously. From the same mouth come blessings and cursings, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? No, of course not. Then he says another, another illustration. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? Can a fig tree bear olives? Should a fig tree be bearing olives? No, of course not. What should a fig tree be bearing? Figs. What should a Christian be bearing? Bad fruit or good fruit? Good fruit. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? Can a grapevine produce figs? No, of course not. Grapevine produces grapes. We should be producing those good fruits that, the, that, that Jesus Christ has told us about. And he says at the end there, neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Not pond of... that. Psalm 23, he leads us by the rivers. He leads us by still waters. He leads us by those fresh ponds, not salty, stagnant ponds. It's not where the, the life comes from. It's not where 
it's not what we should be pouring forth. We should be pouring forth fresh, life-giving water. Everything we, we say causes us to do something. If we say bad things, it will cause us to do bad things. There's a great saying that some, somebody, somebody wrote, and it, it's one of those anonymous things. He said, out of the mouths of good men come good words. Out of the mouths of sinful men come sinful words. So why are those men good? Because they say good things. Why are those other men sinful? Because they say sinful things. So we need to put a guard upon our mouth, a filter, so that when we speak, swift to hear, slow to speak. That's what we need to be. So that we realize with that power that we have in our tongue, we use it to glorify God, to bring forth his kingdom. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for what you have given us. You have given us the power, Lord, to speak to people, to preach your gospel message, to build their lives up, to edify them, to lead them into your kingdom, away from eternal hellfire and damnation, to open the gates into heaven, Lord, to usher them through into your presence. Lord, this is the power you have given us and the smallest member of our bodies, our tongues. Father, we ask you would guard us this, this week. You would help us, Lord, to realize that what we say has an awesome effect upon our lives and the lives of others. And that awesome effect should be to your glory. And we ask this in your blessed name. Amen.